Oh, um, thanks, Joshua, for that um, lovely introduction. And um, wow, um, what an amazing group of people. You know, I get to go to healthcare improvement events um, all over the globe, and I don't think um, there's any other um, like locality that I could go to with uh, 2,500 people. Really um, amazing. So what I want to talk about for the next hour is some of the, the themes and, and trends that we see around the world in terms of, of how change is changing. So all of us that are interested in quality improvement, in transformation and change, I think need to take note of where the wider world is going. Just to say, um, I've, uh, I've, just, um, I've tweeted out these slides. So um, if anybody would like the slides to follow along, if you just go on Twitter, they're there. So um, what I hope is that a, a big theme for the future is around connection and interaction. And yeah, I hope that we can model that together this afternoon. So really want to encourage you to tweet um, using the hashtag HQT2016. Uh, and I want to create a little challenge for you. Because of our, our theme around connectivity and platforms, can we try and make our Twitter conversational? So rather than like just you know, tweeting out, wow, that's a great slide. Okay, when, when you see you know, some people um, tweeting with our hashtag, can you reply to them? And let's see if we can get a bit of conversation going. And um, during this session, we've also got a special Twitter monitor, Jennifer. And she's going to come up on the stage before the end of the hour and um, tell us what's been happening in social media. So what I'd like to do to start with is to talk to you about five big themes that we see in the bigger world of change and transformation. So my job, I'm the Chief Transformation Officer for, the, um, for NHS England. So a big part of my job is linking up with other leaders of change, practitioners, researchers, futurists from the healthcare sector and from many other industries. And you know, whoever I talk to around the world, people are talking about the same big five themes. So that's where we're going to start. So the first theme that we see globally is that change is becoming increasingly disruptive, you know, large scale. There will always, always be a place for small scale incremental improvement. But on its own, it isn't enough. You know, um, we're moving to a much more disruptive world. So when people say, oh, you know, I'm, we're just fat so fatigued by change, we're just worn out by change, can't we just get out off of the hamster wheel for a little while? The reality is that the hamster wheel is going to get faster, okay? The trajectory is going upwards and we need to be prepared for that world. So what does that mean in terms of the ways that the organisations and systems are going about change? The first thing if, I think is represented in this quote here from one of the leaders of IBM. And you know, what they say, we rarely see two, three or four year change projects anymore. Okay. It's obvious why, because if you have a change project that takes two years or three years, you get to the end of the project and the, the outcomes are obsolete. And we're very much moving across the world to an era of 30, 60, 90 day change projects. And it doesn't mean to say that the projects are, are any less complex, but in a sense we're, we're, um, we're, we're trying to do things in much, in much speedier, contained ways. The second thing that we see is the demise of the pilot project. And what we're seeing across the world is that um, previously where we would have piloted things, you know, for six months or 12 months or 24 months, instead what we're seeing is rapid testing and prototyping for exactly the same reasons, you know, that pilots often take a very long time, they cost a lot of money, they take a lot of resources, and they, they can be high risk. Whereas um, fast tests and prototypes, you know, can happen very, very quickly, they take, a lot more, um, they take a lot less resource, and they're a lot less risky. So in a sense, you know, globally, 
um, when, we, when we're talking about methods for change, there's this very big shift towards uh, person-centred design, uh, prototyping, ra rapid testing. The second big theme that we see across the world is what I'm calling here the acceleration of connectedness. And it's the revolution that is created for us by all things digital. You know, every one of us can connect with virtually um, anyone else, anywhere in the world, you know, at a very little cost or very little effort, 24 hours a day. And, you know, when you look at um, our hashtag today for this conference, you know, people aren't just connecting in this room, people are connecting with this meeting today um, all over the world. Here's an example of that. Here's a meeting I was at um, a, a few weeks ago. You know, this, this tweet says, the modern conference table, no one's looking at the screen, they're all on social media. You know, that, that any meeting we're at isn't just happening in the room anymore. So, those of us who lead um, change and improvement and transformation, okay, we need to be developing our digital skills. They will be such critical skills for the future. In the future, it will be digital practitioners who will lead and plan and execute change. So if that's the future, where are we now? Let me just show you something about um, our uh, community in the National Health Service in England. We've got a, a, a national initiative, a fantastic initiative, which is called the Q Community. And across England, a community is being built of 5,000 local improvement leaders so that we can bring our improvers together and you know, we can share and connect and we can learn. And the, the, the Q initiative, the Q community, is being evaluated by the RAND Corporation. And as part of their evaluation, they asked members of the Q community, you know, the most um, uh, upstanding improvement leaders um, in the country, how they prefer to communicate. Don't you think that's interesting, you know, that um, most of our, our improvers, you know, are much more comfortable in a space that is, that is non-digital, that is face-to-face. -face. And, you know, the world I live in, which is increasingly digital and it's proactive, there's only, um, there's only six people in that world, okay? So I think, you know, all of us who are improvement leaders need, need to be thinking, how are we developing our digital skills? Okay, the next theme that we see globally is that hierarchical power is diminishing. Note that it says diminishing, not diminished. Okay, why is that? Because actually, hierarchical structures were designed for a very different world to the one that we're in today. They were designed for a world where the work that people did was very stable and secure, that it only changed gradually. You know, and um, in that world, it made sense to organize the work that people did into little discrete units. But now, in this fast-moving, disruptive digital world, the work doesn't fit like that as much. And what it often means is that um, people who have got the positional power at the top of the system they'll pull their lever of, um, of positional power and nothing happens. <laughs> and, you know, um, I think Clay Sharkey gets it right here when he talks about the shift that is happening in terms of communications. And, you know, in the old world, okay, of hierarchical systems, it made sense, you know, we used to call them communication trees, you know, where we had a, a communication system that went to kind of top to bottom. But our reality now is that communication happens in a many-to-many -many networked way. The fourth theme that we see globally is the rise of the maker movement. And what this means is across the world we're seeing an, um, uh, a renaissance of do it yourself, have a go, make things, you know, try things out. And this is very much fueled by digital connectivity because people that are makers around the globe are able to connect with each other. I get to show you a couple of examples of this. Um, this was an event that I was involved in a few weeks ago and it took place in a, in a borough, okay, in, a, um, in a local government area in, in London um, called Hammersmith and Fulham. Do you know that London, England has the highest rate of child obesity of any major city in the world? And in Hammersmith and Fulham, 
40% of 10 and 11 year olds are either obese or seriously overweight. And, and it's a massive problem because an obese 10 or 11 year old is likely to grow up into an obese adult with you know, many, many problems and complications and issues. So what we normally do is we, you know, we call in the public health professionals and we look at the evidence and we come up with a, um, you know, um, a healthy eating strategy. And um, what the leaders in Hammersmith and Fulham decided to do as well was to bring together 150 people from across the community, lots of young people, um, community members, uh, local owners of fast food shops, uh, coders, designers, creatives, public health professionals, and put them all in teams and got them to make solutions to these issues around healthy and fit young people. And what they came up with was, was truly amazing. And there was a judging panel which was made up of like local celebrity footballers and the mayor and a few other people. And they, they, they um, judged these ideas and several of them now are being put into um, action with a 100 day challenge, okay? But it's a kind of different and additional way of doing things with a lot of energy. And here's another great example of the maker movement. This is a project called Night Scout. And this was started by a, a, a father of a, of a, um, a small child. Um, his son had type one diabetes and it was very troubling to his parents that the, the, the um, little boy was going to school without any continuous glucose monitoring. So the father went down his garden shed, okay, got out his tools and made a monitor. And um, what happened is, obviously, because of the power of social media, people all over the world have picked up on this. It's called the Night Scout Project. And now, you know, absolutely globally, Okay? Thousands and thousands of people are making their own continuous glucose monitors. And of course, what's happened is that you know, um, a number of people in the medical profession are horrified. You know? How on earth can patients make their own monitors? You know? um, you know, they, they have to solder them. Um, but, but actually, the reality is it's making a real difference. And you know, it's, it's a different kind of relationship here. It's, it's patient and parent as expert. You know, patient and parent as maker and patient and parent as collaborator um, in, a, you know, in a radically different way. The final big theme that we see is across the world, change is moving to the edge. What do we mean by that? Well, if you look globally at what's happening in, in the manufacturing sector, in big pharma, what we see is that the research and development and innovation functions that used to be right in the middle of the organization have now moved out to the edge of the organization. And again, it's obvious why it needs to happen. Because in such a fast moving um, world of change, any organization that wants to keep up in innov innovation terms has to be very outwardly focused. So what we need to do is we need to position our innovators with one foot inside the organization and one foot outside. And having one foot outside is about being able to connect up with lots of other people. And it's also about having a space to do radically different things. You know, what I'd say about this is, you know, when, when it comes to being on the edge, maybe things haven't actually changed. And um, this comes from Gary Hamill. Gary Hamill is, according to the Financial Times, the most um, influential um, uh, business writer in the world. And he says, change always starts on the fringe or at the edge, and it always starts with the activists. You know, sometimes in the healthcare system, we think change starts in the middle and it starts at the top, but actually that's not the reality. And all that I think is happening now is we're accepting this reality and we're putting systems in place um, to enable it. Okay? I'm going to show you an example now of an organisation that has understood this. And I think this is quite significant. Because if this, if this organization understands it okay, and gets it, then it really must be happening. And, um, and this organization, okay, I'll show you here, is the British Cabinet Office. Okay? So the Cabinet Office, okay, in the middle of Whitehall in London, the heart of government. Okay? And I actually, I stole this from the Cabinet Office website. 
And basically what the Cabinet Office in, in Britain has decided to do is to move its policy innovation function out from the middle of the Cabinet Office to sit right on the edge. Okay? And again, the reason it's done that is because it understands that if we want to do radical policy innovation, we can't do that from the middle of Whitehall. We have to get out to the edge of the system and we have to be connecting you know, with the wider system. So look what's happening here. Okay? It's a very different model. Rather than having you know, policy innovation happening in the middle and pushing it down or pushing it um, you know, um, out, actually the change is happening on the outside and we're pulling it in. This is my favourite quote about, about being on the edge. It comes from Islet Barron and she says, leading from the edge brings us into contact with a far wider range of relationships and in turn this increases our potential for diversity in terms of thought, experience and background. Just pause there a moment. You know, when we look at this, the, the changing world of change and the things that are being talked about, this term word diversity is right up there at the top. And often in our world, when we talk about diversity, we talk about it in the context of diversity and inclusion. You know, how can we make sure that we have a workforce that is representative of the people that we serve? Or how can we make sure that everyone has a voice? In, in this context, okay, it includes um, that kind of diversity, but it's much wider. Okay? It's about you know, how can we make sure that we get many, many different voices, okay? that we're building diversity, disruption, um, and, um, and different views okay, into our change thinking. And the evidence on this is very clear. What we know is that if you bring together diverse teams of people, they will consistently make better decisions than small groups of so-called experts. So very much a part of our future needs to, about, needs to be about building diversity. Because as Islet Barron says here, diversity in this context leads to more disruptive thinking, faster change and better outcomes. And you know, if, um, if um, Ontario wants to be the, the, um, the best place in the world for healthcare, and I think that's a fantastic thing to want to be, Okay, then there's a real need to bring, um, I would say, to bring diversity um, into our thinking and our practice in, in every way we can. So it's very helpful, I think, to think about um, the difference between old power and new power um, in this brave new world. So let's start off by thinking about old power. Old power is like a currency. It's like money. A few people have got it and most of us haven't, okay? Positional authority. It's held by a, a few people. And this kind of power, positional authority, gets pushed down in organisations. And people are commanded to do things. You have to do that because it's the provincial quality standard or you have to do that because it's the performance goal or you have to do that because it's the activity target. Yeah? Um, and typically old power is closed because old power can only work to the edge of an organisation you, know, you can only command people to do things so far so a healthcare organisation that is working with, um, with patient and, and, um, and caregiver advisors can't command those patient and caregiver advisors to do anything because okay? they don't fit in the hierarchy and largely old power is transactional it's about processes and structures and performance management systems and holding people to account. Let's contrast that with new power. New power is like a current. It, it, it surges with energy when people come together with, uh, with a common cause. And new power, we pull it into our organisations and systems. So every time that we ask patients and caregivers to be partners with the formal system, we're pulling in new power. Okay? And new power is shared by many people with a common cause. And, and it's open, you know, we're not closing, we're, we're not kind of closing the doors here. Anybody who um, shares our mission, who shares our calls, who wants to be part of our call to action can be part of it. And largely, 
New power is about relationships. The thing about new power is people engage in it because they want to, not because they have to. So because it's a question of, of choice, you know, um, if I don't trust um, the, the uh, you know, other people, if, if I don't trust that, the, that I'm giving my time voluntarily or gladly, and if the things that I think are going to happen don't happen, then I won't engage again. So largely, I'd say, you know, um, new power is I, the things I do because I want to do. Old power is the things I do because I have to do uh, because they're the rules of the system. So, you know, some of the people that um, I get to connect with who are the kind of far out futurists, um, they talk about the death of old power. Um, I don't think that old power will be dying in any healthcare organisation that I know um, any time soon. Okay. However, what I do see is like a layer of new power that's coming on the top and it, it opens all kinds of possibilities for change. What I'd also say is that like where we need to be, okay, you know, the people that are leading change, that are passionate about change, actually we need to be able to operate in that very difficult zigzaggy place in the middle with the red um, and the green. What I'd also say is all of us need to be um, developing new power skills and capabilities because, you know, as I was saying, old power doesn't work as well as it used to, okay? So even where I'm a leader with positional authority and power, I need to be learning new power ways of doing things. So um, this article um, was, uh, it's, actually it's a Canadian article, um, written by Batalana and Casciaro, um, and it's called The Network Secrets of Great Change Agents. And what they did was they went into a very big organisational system and they followed 68 change projects around that big system. And the reason they did it was to try to understand, you know, who, who are the best change agents? Okay. What are the characteristics or the position of the people that can make change happen in organisations? Okay. Apart from the people that were in my workshop yesterday, okay, who knows what is the name of the big organisational system that these two Canadian researchers um, follow the change projects around? Anybody know? I'll tell you. It's the English National Health Service. Okay. <laughs> so they, they followed 68 change projects around the NHS. What they found was that actually being an effective change agent and uh, enabling change to happen was very little to do with position in the formal hierarchy. It was very little to do with old power. Okay? It was much more to do with new power. It was much more to do with the, the level of influence that people had at the, at the heart of the network. Okay? So if you like, um, you know, so many people say to me, oh, Helen, you know, I can't make change happen. I'm only a charge nurse, or I'm only a trainee doctor, or I'm only a student nurse, or I'm, you know, I'm only an admin support person. But guess what? Actually, being an effective change agent isn't to do with where we are in the hierarchy. It's, it's to do with, you know, how we organise. So let's talk about who is going to make this change happen, or, or who makes change happen? I want to start off, this is list A, okay? And, and again, this is written for my English context, so you'll have to kind of translate into Canadian. Um, but I think you'll kind of get the point of it. So, we, we are going to have a big transformation project in our, in our um, uh, you know, uh, hospital organisation or um, you know, in our geographical area. So who's going to make the change happen? Okay. Is it the Transformation Programme Board or whatever equivalent title? Is it the very senior leader or the minister who is the programme sponsor? Is it the programme management office that oversees the, the programme? Is it the, um, the leads of the 27 work streams? Okay. Of course, we have to have clinical leadership, so it's the, is it the clinical leads of the work streams? Is it the unit managers or is it the improvement facilitators? Okay? Are they the people that are going to make the change happen? Or is it list B? Okay. You know, the, the, the mavericks and the rebels, the positive deviants who are the people that can do things differently and succeed. Okay? 
the contrarians because they know they can, the people that are non-conformist because they can see the world through a lens that nobody else can see, the hyper-connected, and some hyper-connected people are wonderful when you're, doing, when you're trying to lead change, and some hyper-connected people are very difficult, okay? And whether, you know, whichever category they come in, okay, these hyper-connected people, as, uh, as the Canadian research showed us, are, um, are the people that can make the change happen. They spread behaviours, they can role model at a very big scale, they can literally set mountains on fire, and they can multiply and scale anything they get their hands on. Okay? And, uh, or is it the hyper-connected? You know? And there's multiple reasons why people are hyper-connected, and it doesn't really matter which, but the fact that hyper-connected means that they can make change happen. So, you know what I'd say? is that the people who live and perform in the formal organisation land, list A, and the people with the power to make and break change, the list B, are actually two different lists. And you know what? We need both. Okay? I don't know of a single example of sustainable, of sustained transformational change anywhere in healthcare in the world that was achieved um, uh, just by list A. Okay? We need to be working with both. Okay? What's the evidence? Well, starting in this top left-hand corner, if you look okay, at the research into the failure of large-scale transformational change projects, what it tells us is that it's rarely due to the content or the structure of the plans. Okay? It's rarely due to whether or not we got McKinsey or, or um, Deloitte in um, for um, you know, three months to do analysis and came up with a fantastic plan, okay? or, um, or the timescales of the plan. Okay? That's not what makes um, large-scale change fail, typically. Okay? It's much more about the role of informal networks. Okay? It's, the, it's the list B people. You know, it's the, um, the hyper-connected, it's the influencers okay, in the organisations or systems affected by change. And we have to conclude that actually if we want to make radical transformational change happen, we've, we need to, to, um, to connect the networks of the people that want to make the change happen. And this is where I see quality improvement approaches often going wrong. Okay? Um, you know, I am um, an advocate, a student, um, a lover of um, quality improvement methods. But too often, what happens is we come up with some great you know, methodology for change, but then we try and implement them in an old power list A world. And what happens is that the uh, improvement methods tend to um, just reinforce the mechanistic and the hierarchical models that are consistent with the mental maps of those managers. So another thing, you know, we need to think about, okay, is your change process a cathedral or is it a bazaar? And um, certainly in the NHS in England, we have a lot of cathedrals, okay? Who has a change process that looks like that? Okay, a few of us, yeah. Okay, but in a sense, you know, we create these cathedrals, these big structures for change with you know, the program management office and, um, and the critical paths and the, um, you know, the um, senior responsible officers and so on. The reality is that the way the world is going is increasingly we need to create change processes that are much more like bazaars, where people can come together, where they can share, um, where, where they can connect. And of course we need cathedrals, we need structures and systems for change. But actually, much of the real change will happen in the, in the bizarre context. Which brings me on to my, um, my big theme, which is about the power of platforms. Okay? Platforms are changing the world of change. And very nice quote here from Ashoka, who says, you know, when you think about Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and many of their less, lesser um, cousins, they've proved the power of the platforms and the way that platforms change the world. And what these platforms have shown us is that if your average 21st century citizen gets given tools that, that enable them to connect and share and the freedom to create and think differently, that typically what people will do is, is to do that with, a, with an enthusiasm 
and a creativity and an originality that actually is better than so-called creative industries. And um, yeah, I think um, just look at this last sentence, you know, and, and thinking about this around the world of change and how leadership of change is changing. Okay, good leadership in this world is no longer about taking charge or imposing a strategic vision, but about creating the platforms that allow others to flourish and create. And uh, I think that we can reach no other conclusion than this is the era of the platform. And it applies to our world of change and improvement and transformation as much as any other kind of platform. You see, change comes naturally when you actually create a platform that now allows people to um, identify their shared interests and to brainstorm solutions. So I would contend that we are moving from the era of the change program to the era of the change platform. So let's just talk about this. In a world of change programs, we talk about you know, systematic change management as, as if you can manage a complex um, human change process like you could uh, an IT project or a, or a new build of a, of a hospital. So I don't think there's anything wrong with change programs per se, it's the way that we go about them. Okay? And what I see is too often our leaders will not only prescribe what the outcomes of the change that we want for the change programme, but they will prescribe in a, in a kind of micro way what the method of change must be as well. And as a result, people at the front line of care, um, communities, patients and families, they will experience that change as imposed, you know, like they, you have to do it, rather than embraced, want to do it. In the world of the change platform, by contrast, we want everyone, and we shouldn't have to write including service users and families, okay, um, can help tackle the most challenging issues. Okay? Here's that word diversity again. You know, in this world, we value diversity of, of, of thought. So contrasting that with, um, with change programs, in a world of change programs, very often you know, we'll talk about um, overcoming or managing resistance to change. In a world of change programs, if you know, people um, don't want to play ball, then we put horrible labels on them, like in denial or laggard um, or resistor. Okay? In the world of change platforms, actually, we, we welcome different views and perspectives because it means that we, get, we end up with, with better outcomes. So what change platforms enable us to do are to connect people, ideas, and learning. And in the world of change platforms, the role of the formal leaders is to create the conditions for change to happen and then get out of the way and let people get on with it. And you know, it's great to hear Bob Bell here talking about the, the patient's first platform. Again, very much part of um, this direction and this movement. And you know, why are we doing it? Because today, platforms can power learning and innovation and, um, and, and change okay, at, at a, a, a very fast speed by providing collaborative and sometimes exponentially productive spaces for people to create value. So, there's many, many different kinds of change platforms. Um, here are some of the ones that we work with. There are connecting platforms that bring people together. There are mobilizing platforms that call people to action. There are learning platforms that enable people to come together and learn and share. Okay. There are knowledge platforms for curating and understanding what, what good is. And there are crowdsourcing platforms where we can you know, really learn from the wisdom of the crowd. And all of these kinds of platforms overlap. Um, I'm going to show you some example ones and then we're going to create our own change platform. Okay? We're going to have a live change platform. Okay? But I'll just show you some um, example ones first. Moodox, massive online open disease orientated communities. This is about, you know, groups of patients kind of, you know, coming together and, and literally changing the face of the healthcare system. If you look globally, 
there are something like 60,000 online diabetes communities and around 80 million different online patient communities. Um, and you know, the, these communities are having a massive impact. So um, if we just look at exam the example on the right-hand side there, you know, the Metastatic Breast Cancer Project. Um, in the past, researchers um, who were looking at metastatic breast cancer would have to go through quite a laborious series of stages um, to be able to connect with people with metastatic breast cancer. Now, because of the opportunities that the digital world and social media um, gives us, they're able to connect directly. And it means that you know, research and science can move on um, so much more quickly. The best known um, uh, patient community is, is patients like me. Okay? You know, um, hundreds of thousands of people across the world are, are, um, are, you know, are joining the community. And it means that, for instance, um, here you've got the example with the American College of Cardiology is, is creating a diabetes collaborative registry with patients like me. Okay. Patients organising digitally, um, I just think I'm going to make, is, it, it, it is and will continue to make a massive difference. Okay. Um, here's one of our platforms from the NHS in England, and it's called the Academy of Fabulous Stuff. And um, this was started from the edge, actually. It's some people that are big fans of the NHS were getting really um, uh, angry because the NHS often gets such a bad um, you know, um, show in the media and uh, wanted to actually create a platform where we could just show all the really fabulous stuff that the NHS is doing. So, so this, um, you know, this um, platform, which is called the Academy of, um, of Fabulous Stuff, was set up. And uh, it, you know, it, loads and loads and loads of people connect with it. And it isn't just a repository where you know, people put their ideas on. People are, are sharing and connecting and talking all the time. So if you just talk about, tell you about one of the examples there, dovetailing vaccination schemes. What happened there, that was a, um, a scheme in London. Uh, it was about vaccinations for teenagers. And instead of having to have three separate vaccinations, they were dovetailed. So um, teenagers only had to have one vaccination. Okay. The day that that went on to the Academy of Fabulous Stuff platform, 160 other organisations inquired about it. Um, <clears throat> this one's fun. This one's from the US, from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and it's called Flip the Clinic. And what it's basically about is it's a, um, a platform, an open experiment to transform the experience of patients and clinicians together. And... Um, Part of the reason I like this one is because it shows that platforms aren't just digital. Platforms can be can be face to face as well. And with Flip the Clinic, you can join in digitally. You can submit a flip, an idea. You can offer feedback. You can become a friend, an ally, or you can go to a Flip the Clinic day in a particular city and join in. Um, this one I like very much. Um, it is a um, platform that's been set up by Open IDEO. IDEO is, um, is a global design house. And Open IDEO is their platform to help to solve um, some of the world's biggest challenges. And the most recent one that they had was about reimagining the end of life experience. And basically, you know, there's a, there's a process that it goes through, but, but people submit their ideas and other people can uh, add to them, uh, they, can, they can vote on them. Um, the ideas that came out of that were really fantastic. One of the winning ideas um, from um, Open IDEO End of Life Experience was about sound. Uh, because apparently when your senses go at the end of life, the last sense that goes is sound. And what people um, can do under this um, initiative is to actually specify the, the sound that they'd like to hear, the last, um, the, you know, the last sense that they have. Um, this is a very local one. This is in Coventry, um, where I live, and, um, and it's called Mind the Gap. And, um, and it's about local people coming together. It's creating a platform um, to bridge the gap between services and people being able to have, um, to have great lives. So, um, we're going to have a go now. Okay, I just want to show you how easy it is um, to, uh, to create a platform. And also, I'm um, you know, aware that we've got 2,000 of the best brains in Ontario here in the room, and, uh, and we should be um, using them. So, we're going to use a really simple platform. It's, co it's, called, um, it's called Slido, and, uh, and it's a free platform. Anybody can use it. 
And what I want you to think about is, I mean, um, you know, let's, um, uh, let's take the Bob Bell challenge, okay? So Bob Bell said, you know, um, we want Ontario to be the best um, place in the world for healthcare. So what one thing do you think would make the biggest difference in improving the healthcare system, okay? So that, that's the question. Okay, remember that question. What one thing would make the biggest difference? So what we'd like you to do now is to join in. So on your smartphone or your tablet or your laptop, will you go to Slido, sli.do, okay? So um, if, you, if, you, um, if you just put that link in, and it will ask you for an event code, and if you put in 7674 and click join the event, there will be a space that says type your question. And in that space that says type your question, will you add your tip, will you add um, the, the one thing that you think will make um, the biggest difference? Will you then add your name before you click? In a moment, I'm going to go on to the Slido page. Okay, I'm just going to give you a couple, I'm just going to give you a couple more minutes to do that. You will see all the answers appearing. And what I want you to do is to vote for the ones that you like best by clicking on the thumbs up. And we'll see which, I, we'll do this really quickly. Okay, and this is going to, this is going to happen really, really quickly because there's so many of us. Which, which is the, um, our feedback to Bob Bell, okay, around, um, around what we need to do. Okay, is everybody that wants to there? Okay, can we, can we um, switch to the Slido? Can we see this? Okay, let's just sit it. Lots of anonymous. Okay, so are there other, so when you, can you see any there? You probably can't see at the back. Um, okay, we've got love, we've got feedback. See if you can, um, you can see any of them going through quickly and just give them a click. Click ones you like. Okay, um, I've, got a I've got a prize for the best one, and unfortunately, a lot of those are anonymous. So um, it'll be the highest one that's got a name on. So just give it another minute. Okay. Um, now, what's interesting is that... Um, um, Glenn and Stanley are staff. Um, the, the person who did the top one around patient access to data, do you know who you are? Because I've got a prize for you. <laughs> who put patient access to data? You put your, if you, over here, okay. Um, so um, let me show you what I've got you. Um, can we go back to the slides? Okay. I've got you my favorite book. So do you want to come and get it? Who did patient access to data? Very good. There you go. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, very good. Thank you. <laughs> very good. <clears throat> so, I mean, that was, that was a bit quick and a bit crazy, but you kind of get, you get a sense of it. So I think, you know, more and more we're going to be moving into a world of uh, platforms. And the thing about, about platforms is that people think, you know, it's about um, a, a technical platform or, um, you know, a, a, a link, um, you know, that you, um, you know, a, a digital space that you do stuff. Actually, um, platforms are about 95% relational and about 5% um, technical. And this, this model here comes from a guy called Simon Terry. And um, basically, you know, we start at a level of um, uh, maturity down here where we're just starting to connect with each other. And as we get better at, um, at, at um, you know, connecting in a, in, a, um, in a new era, we move into sharing more, okay? And then we move into solving. So we actually come together and we problem solve. 
and then at the, the, the top level, we get to, um, we get to innovate, uh, which, is, which is where real platforms happen. Okay? And um, what I'd say is when I look at, um, at England, okay, there's a number of organisations in my system that are getting near to that innovate platform level. So um, the first here is South West Yorkshire Partnership um, um, NHS Trust, and they've got a system called iHub. And iHub enables um, people in that organisation to contribute constantly, um, you know, uh, ideas, um, challenges, solutions. Okay. Um, Leeds Teaching Hospital have got a platform system called Wayfinder, and they had 4,000 people help to design their strategic approach to identify um, their, their behaviours and values. And um, here, Dorset Healthcare has got a system, a platform called iMatter, which again enables um, people to, to constantly be contributing. And the thing about this isn't that they've actually got digital platforms, which they all have, it's that the, um, that the digital platforms aren't a flash in the pan, that the leaders are very, very committed and, and, and you know, everything gets followed up that, that uh, you know, where people contribute to the platform, um, they're, they're, they're thanked, um, uh, people are encouraged to, to vote. Um, there's very, very active community management of those platforms. And that's really very, very important because when people give and contribute to a platform, they do so um, willingly and voluntarily. And if things don't get followed up, people won't bother again. So what I wanted to do finally is just show you some of the platforms that my team work with. So we don't work with any change platforms now. We only work, uh, we only work with, sorry, change programs. We only work with platforms. So the first one I wanted to, um, to show you is our, is our learning platform, um, which is called the School for Health and Care Radicals. And the reason why we set this up was because we did a learning review across England, and what it showed us was that many of our, um, our colleagues, okay, who were the people that delivered care, doctors, nurses, allied health professionals, um, support workers, uh, felt that they couldn't even make small improvements in their services because they didn't have permission. And the challenge is, is that if we wait for people to get to, you know, if we wait to change the culture so that people feel they've got permission, we might have to wait a very long time. So how can we work with our, with our colleagues to help them feel more skilled and confident about change? Um, so we set up a virtual school, and it's called the School for Health and Care Radicals, and it's a learning platform. And we run it once a year um, for five weeks. And um, it's based on a learning theory called connectivism. Okay. Connectivism is a learning theory for a digital age. And basically, the, the, the idea of connectivism is that people learn more because they connect with, with other people like them and learn from each other than they do through kind of formal teaching processes. Okay. To date, nearly 10,000 people have taken part in our school from um, 40 countries. <coughs> And um, we've, uh, we, have a, we have a very um, active Canadian engagement. Uh, we had 47 learning chapters in Australia. Um, so the thing about it is that we offer it for free. And we don't put any barriers on it, because actually it's a virtual learning um, platform. So it doesn't cost us any more if more people do it than if only a few people do it. And we thought, if we start to put boundaries on it, then we'll actually end up um, stopping the very people that we, um, that we want to be part of this. So, um, you know, we kind of, anybody can be in it. And, um, and we have a lot of colleagues from, from healthcare. We have lots of patient and family activists um, that are part of it. Uh, we have people from the police um, that are in it. Uh, uh, lots of people from education, lots of people from lots of different sectors. And um, we, we had our school evaluated, and we had it evaluated by the Chartered Institute for Personnel and Development. And they have a team that uh, all that team does is evaluate learning interventions. And what they showed was that there was a positive effect at both the level of the individuals and their organisations at every measure that they looked at. So in terms of the, the change knowledge that, that was built, um, the, the people's sense of purpose and their motivation to improve their, their practice, 
their ability to not just challenge the status quo, but to rock the boat and stay in it. And the most important thing was about connecting with others to build support for, um, for change. And we couldn't have done that without it being a learning platform. <clears throat> and earlier this year, we ran something called the NHS Transformathon. And what we did was we decided to run a 24-hour um, digital broadcast platform around transformational change. Um, uh, my little team. And um, everything was done for free, and we did it ourselves. I mean, it was classic maker movement. We got 150 people to be speakers over 24 hours. And what we basically did, we had the Brits in the daytime, and then overnight we had our Canadian friends and our Australian friends and our friends from New Zealand and USA and, uh, and so on. Do you know, um, it, uh, nearly 100,000 people connected with it, 97,000 people. And uh, here's in the middle of the night, here's a team from um, Victoria, Australia, talking about um, seven-day services. And then we're going to run another one while we're, we're um, providing the platform for it. So um, uh, after we ran that tran the, uh, the um, NHS Transformathon, um, some of our, um, our friends um, who are uh, patient and citizen activists and community activists said, can, can we, we'd like to run one. Um, will you help us? So we said yes. So basically, we've got this um, eight-hour um, uh, transformathon, the People's Transformathon, which is all about people doing amazing stuff around the world, um, around patients and families and citizens. And that's going to be on the 28th of November. And it starts at um, 12 noon in England. So, um, so if we take five hours off, it's, um, it starts at 7 a.m. here. And um, Again, if you, if you look out for that, it's going to be on the 28th of November, and the, um, the hashtag is um, hashtag CoPro, which is co-production uh, 16. And another platform that we run is a mobilizing platform, uh, which was yesterday. So um, for the last three years, we've had something called NHS Change Day. And NH on NHS Change Day, what happens is that, that hundreds of thousands of people in our system uh, take, and take action to make a difference for patients. And this year, we combined NHS Change Day with the Academy of Fabulous Stuff platform. And we created Fabulous Change Day. And it was actually yesterday. Um, and, um, and I was here, but I still joined in. And um, I, d um, I think, I don't know what the figures are yet, but it's tens and tens and tens of thousands of people taking action through that mobilizing platform that is Fab Change Day. And, you know, sometimes we do some um, really fast platforms. So this is one that we ran here um, with um, our colleagues at Nottingham University Hospitals. And they had a particular issue around should we run routine radiology in investigations um, through the night. So we said, we'll set up a change platform for you. And we engaged a whole load of people in that. Do you know, 3,000 people joined in. And they got the most incredible feedback. And it's interesting because it, it, the outcome was different to what I thought it would be. So the question was, should we be waking up um, people who are in hospital for routine elective um, surgery in the middle of the night to have a scan? And that, my view is, of course we shouldn't. That's outrageous. But actually, um, most of the, the, the patients um, thought it was OK, providing people were asked and given a choice. Um, so just finally, you know, what are some of the lessons that we've learned about working with change um, platforms? Okay. Number one, you can't control the outputs of a crowd. So once you go down this step road, you can't like put a step in the, um, in the water and then not like it and run back again, you know, because people will never engage again. And then this was a lesson that was learned um, quite well recently in Britain. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> So one of our research councils, um, yeah, you know what's coming, okay? The National Environment Research Council went out to the crowd to say, we've got this fabulous new 200 million pound polar research vessel. Please help us name our ship, okay? What happened, okay? <laughs> okay, what happened um, was the crowd decided to name it Boaty McBoatface. <laughs> okay, which got 10 times as many votes as the next most popular answer. 
And then it was problematic because the, the, the NERC had said to the crowd, you know, come up with a name, and then they didn't like the name. Um, <laughs> So what they did in the end was a compromise. So um, the NERC, they named the boat David Attenborough, but on the side of it is like this little submarine. So the submarine is now proudly called Boaty McBoatface. Um, um, but you know, I think there's a kind of serious point here. Um, so um, uh, somebody I know um, who works in this field, they, they, um, they were um, supporting a bank and the bank um, wanted to do uh, create a platform around um, you know um, the views of staff so they they created a platform to say um, you know what are your biggest issues and what problems should we be focusing on to solve so the, the biggest piece of feedback that came back from the staff was about the performance management system in this bank and because it was very, very unpopular with the staff. But when the management of this bank got this feedback, they didn't like it because they didn't want to change the performance management system. So what they did was they pretended that the, that the performance management system wasn't the number one issue, that something else was. And of course, what happened was that the staff knew that the performance management um, system was the, was, was you know, the, the top issue. But um, what it basically meant was it completely destroyed trust, you know? Um, and uh, um, the thing about this, about any platform, people engage with it voluntarily. So, you know, um, you have to follow up. Okay? The next thing is people want a relationship. You know what we said about old power, new power, um, transactional, relational. If people contribute to a platform, they're expecting to have a relationship. They're expecting you know, things to follow up. They're not expecting um, a, a transaction. And just to tell you a little, little story. Um, so um, a few years ago, the team that I was working in uh, commissioned some qualitative research. And it was called From Skeptics to Champions. And what it was about was about um, cancer doctors who used to be very skeptical about quality improvement, who became champions of quality improvement. And what the research looked at was what were the factors that moved somebody from being a skeptic to being a champion of quality improvement. And they came up with some nice research, nice factors. However, what the researchers identified was a subpopulation. And the subpopulation was cancer doctors who started off being skeptics, they then became champions of quality improvement, and they were like enthusiastic, they had all these expectations, they were gonna get this training and support, and things were gonna happen, and it didn't materialize. So they became skeptics again. And what the researchers found was the skeptics who became champions and then became skeptics again were far more skeptical than the people that were just skeptics in the first place. You know? So, so once you start moving down this new power world of relationships and platforms and follow up, you know, we absolutely um, have to do it. So, <clears throat> this is the end of um, this hour, and I just wanted to summarize okay, um, six actions that I think um, are appropriate for the new era of change. Number one, you know, we need to be framing our issues and challenges in ways that will connect with new power, that will engage and mobilize the imagination, the energy, and the will um, for action of a very diverse group of stakeholders. Secondly, we've got to take steps to be more social because the world is becoming more, more social. We need to invest in our digital skills and our social connections. And we need to be leading through networks and communities as well as formal leadership um, systems. Number three, find those people on the B list and give them some really big jobs to do linked to your um, transformation process and you'll be amazed how much they might uh, connect. Number four, what's your equivalent of the edge? And um, you know, create it so that you can incubate radical and disruptive ideas and lead healthcare from the future. Number five, 
Okay? Think about what are the opportunities to work with change platforms for some of your um, important issues and create the bazaars along with the cathedrals. Okay. And finally, think about how can we adopt approaches um, to planning and design that are more emergent. And we're monitoring progress as we go along. Things will fail, we learn, and we adapt as we go. And just to say finally, when you do get hold of the slides, there's some ways to connect. I've left you lots of lovely references. So thank you.